But what are the ultimate examples of a oh, the fucking sun? Ah! Can you you can even see the boom mic is now reflected on is now a shadow on my face like a penis. <laughs> Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark. More on them in just a bit. Oh, hello there. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. What are we talking about today? Well, it's the most terrible jobs from history. What happens here if you're new? Danny writes it. I'm going to read it. And then Sam, our wonderful editor, is going to meme it up with the finest memes you've ever seen. I'm sure most of us are aware that Europe went crazy for leeches between the 15th and the earlier 19th centuries. It was believed that bloodletting was a miracle cure for everything from headaches to hysteria to a slightly itchy left buttock and leeches were in huge demand from the medical industry to perform the crucial bloodletting on the patient. I've had leeches once. I went swimming. It was like, it was actually really nice. There's this big waterfall coming down from this rock face. And then I'm swimming around. So I'm like, oh my God, this is beautiful. It's freezing cold, but it's so beautiful. And then I get out and there's just all these leeches stuck. They're like, they're just grabbed onto my foot and I didn't even notice. And they're like in between the little toes. And I'm like, oh, this is horrible. And my friend's like, oh, don't worry. Just we'll use a lighter and you just burn them off. And I'm like, what, in between my toes? Where my toes are? With are you insane? And he's like, no, it works, it works. It didn't work and I just burned my toes. And I saw these mother leeches on there and I'm just like, okay, I'm just gonna pull them off. And I don't know if that's what you're supposed to do. I didn't look it up afterwards. I don't think I had internet on my phone or whatever. So I was just like, I just pulled them off. I'm not sure if that's what you're supposed to do. Cause then they're like, oh, then their jaws are stuck in, their, in your body for the rest of your life. So maybe I have little leech jaws in my foot to this day. I've checked, I don't think so. I uh, hope you like leeches. A few moments later. Just one question though, how exactly did they get a hold of all these leeches? Spoiler alert, I know the answer to this. There were people who'd go out and collect leeches. They'd wade through bogs like Simon swimming in a waterfall and uh, they'd purposefully get these leeches stuck to them. I guess then they'd burn them off or do whatever magic to actually release them from the body and then they'd sell that I'm sorry I just ruined your script, Danny. But sometimes I'm just too smart. Step forward, the leech collector. Literally, step right forward into the marsh or bog and wait for all of those thirsty leeches to attach themselves to your legs. If you had a bit of money behind your leech collecting enterprise, you might even be able to have shoved an old knackered horse or a dog into the swampy waters to collect all the leeches on your behalf. You know the past was the worst, when human life was so worth nothing that they'd be like, yeah, 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 I mean, a, a barely functional dog, which is 17 years old and has kidney disease. Let's not use him, let's use a child. <laughs> a human child. We don't give a fuck! Girl, how your kids doing? Girl, fuck them kids, yeah. Although based on what you guys have said from my previous comments, you'll be like, Simon, it's pretty clear that a 17 year old dog with kidney failure has the same value of life as a child. It doesn't. <laughs> But the cheapest and most popular option by far was to hike up your trousers or your skirt and wade into the bog yourself to pick up these vital medical supplies. If that doesn't sound bad enough, oh don't worry, it absolutely gets worse. You couldn't just rip off the leeches as soon as they got comfortable on your bare hairy legs. Oh no, if you did that, the teeth of the leech would detach and they'd be utterly worthless. Oh God, I do have little leech mouths in my body, don't I? Ah! Instead, you had to wait for around 20 minutes for the lucrative leeches to get full of blood before you peeled them off and then tossed them into a bucket to sell to the local quack. Well, I mean, at least on the on the positive side, you're getting all the, that leech blood treatment for free, which was totally a legit thing that was not proven wrong in any way. And obviously we still use leeches in medicine all the time. This naturally meant that you'd be wading right back into the filthy waters with open sores. So if you didn't become seriously from blood loss, you become serious now with some kind of troubling infection. Brilliant. <laughs> the job was mostly carried out by women who were paid very little for their critical contribution to crackpot quackery. It was seen as see. The sun is shining in my face. Why is it like this? The, the summer has come. I don't like it. What am I supposed to do? I don't have a curtain. Look, it's even shining on my body. It's stupid. I'm gonna move this microphone and sit slightly over this way. And it's gonna come, it comes this way. It's coming closer to me. It was 
seen as seasonal work as leeches were not particularly active during the cold or winter months. But if you really couldn't get an <laughs> microphone. But if you really couldn't get enough of the swamps, you could always top up your income by poking around in the filthy depths for nodules of iron or in the run up to Christmas. What the f are people doing? This is how we get iron? These leech collectors actually work themselves out of a job in a way by being too productive. By the turn of the 20th century, the medicinal leech was declared extinct in the UK. However, doubts. Whoa! <laughs> Oh my god, what are we ever gonna do? We'll accidentally move on to more productive medicine involving drugs and herbs. <laughs> However, doubts had already been raised over the benefits of bloodletting by the close of the 19th century when it was suspected that leeches may have been doing patients more harm than good. Holy shit. Would have thought it sucking the vital life giving blood out of people. I mean, who would have looked like, look, 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 when we get in a bad accident, we lose, you know, blood comes out of our body. When we get mangled in a tractor, like our leg, it's like, what are we going to do? You tie up the leg, fast, so all the blood doesn't come out. And then the doctors are all like, you know what else we should do? Let's take the blood out of people. What the f sort of logic is that, doctors? This paved the way for Rudolf Virchow's study into cellular processes and the eventual rise of the germ theory of disease which turned out to be a little bit more correct than let's just suck the blood out. Thankfully, the leech made an unexpected comeback from alleged extinction in the 1970s. Oh, thank God the leech came back. What would we ever do without the leech? How about we get rid of the leech? Why do we need to bring that back? Then I could be swimming in that beautiful, uh, the, the waterfall. Did I call it a volcano earlier? Why would I get that confused? I just was gonna say volcano, but that's not correct. It was a waterfall. Uh, and then I wouldn't have leeches attached to my feet afterwards, which would honestly would be preferable. You are made of stupid. They're still very occasionally used for the medicinal purposes of removing blood from congested wounds, such as a severed, a severed finger reattachment. Jesus. But these days, they're farmed rather than collected from dirty swamps. You wouldn't catch anyone willing to wade into the bogs these days to pick up those vampiric critters. I don't know, Daddy. I think you estimate, underestimate how many poor people there are in the world who would absolutely do that for money. They were made of sterner stuff in the olden days. And, uh, yeah. I mean, were, they were, they were. The world was horrible in the past. Whenever there was a sh job that needed to be done there would be no moaning there would be no grumbling i don't think that's true people always complain it's like human condition you will do lots of shit. we'll like sacrifice we'll like work jobs that we hate we'll go to school and study subjects that we hate we'll be in relationships and have friends who we don't like and we'll just be like yeah but we do it don't we why are you the way that you are? Back then, you just had to suck it up. God damn, that's hilarious. Wanted, funeral mute, requirements, the ability to look utterly miserable in complete silence for hours on end. This is coming so fast. Why is this, why? Can you see this here? You can, why? Why? The origins of the funeral mute can be traced. I feel like I'm the wild witch of the fuck. Ah! Or like either that or a sparkly vampire. Sam, can you do some sparkly effects on me? Make me look like Edward. Sam, make me beautiful. He's kind of gay. The origins of the funeral mute can be traced back to ancient Rome. Although it was slightly a jollier job in those days and the mute would only be seen at the funeral of a particularly important person, a professional Roman mime artist would wear a wax mask designed to look like the dearly departed celebrity. Holy shit, that's creepy. Why would you? Imagine going to a funeral and everyone is dressed like the dead person and be like, what the f***? During the funeral procession, he would attempt to silently mime the mannerisms of the deceased in a personification of the deceased's ancestors who would briefly return to Earth to escort the relative to the underworld. This is f***ing weird, boys. It was probably quite a tough job to pull off without words, though. You're right. If the deceased had a pronounced limb or a facial tick, but otherwise you're going to be struggling for a good angle. For me, people could just be doing like this doing like this. I think I managed to tone down what I used to do. Like, there were videos, I think, especially when I used to stand up to present my other channel's videos, and I'll just be like gesticulating like mad. And people would be like, why does I move his hand so much? And I think I managed to rein that in when I decided to sit down. But I don't know, it's just I want to move my hands when I talk. I think it's my Italian blood. I don't have any Italian blood. I don't know why I said that. This just sounds vaguely racist. <laughs>
What is that? What is that? Wait, it By the time we got to the Victorian era, the job had become much simpler. A couple of funeral mutes would stand on either- this is totally empty, that's disappointing- either side of the deceased, dressed entirely in black and each holding a long, cloth-covered stick. They would later help bundle the coffin into the hearse and then lead the procession to the graveyard where they would take up small, uh, similar positions at either side of the church doors. Although most funeral mutes were perfectly capable of speech, their main duty was to remain completely silent silent throughout the whole operation while maintaining an exaggerated, woeful expression on their faces in a display of deep mourning of a person they'd never met. It literally sounds like they used to invite mimes to their funerals. Which is the- mimes are stupid and creepy and I mean, it's a funeral, do we need to make it more creepy? Especially if you're in America where it's like, yeah, yeah, no, we got the casket open, there's old dad there, you can see his cold, dead face, and people go up and give him a kiss, it's like, what the f Bring your little stupid ass on. Open casket funerals, holy sh**. And then there's just a mime. <laughs> what? Why? It's f***ing weird. Christ. Where was this from? I don't even remember. I don't care. So in other words, their role was to look sad and pathetic for the whole day and they weren't allowed to respond to anyone who asked them for a light. The funeral moods had practically died out by the late 19th century as people began to wonder if there was something a bit weird about paying complete strangers to pretend to be sad at the funeral of a loved one. And there's another problem. Many of these funeral mutes didn't hold a steady job, they lacked discipline and they had a taste for alcohol, so not only that, <laughs> but you've also got like, the, the mime is also just getting f***ing drunk. <laughs> Great. I am not fucking drunk. So, as soon as they were finished acting or heartbroken at the funeral, they would nip to the nearest tavern and spend all their wages on getting absolutely sh faced on cheap whiskey to make up for their miserable day. Well, I mean, honestly, that just sounds like life, doesn't it? It's like, I don't know, I like the job I've had now, but I've had bad jobs where I was like, what should we do after work today? Let's go get drunk. <laughs> where are we going? Five o'clock, baby. <laughs> I also felt they're like economics <laughs> after economics. It was Tuesday afternoons at university. Two hours of economics. What are we doing afterwards? Straight to the pub. Straight to do we have coursework? Yes, we do, but we're going to the pub. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. It was fairly likely the mourners of the deceased would pop into the very same town. <laughs> I just got an absolute just random memory out of nowhere of two dudes. This was a big lecture hall for economics. <laughs> and there was just two dudes I remember one time just sitting at the front of the class and they just had a giant Coke bottle <laughs> and it was obviously filled with alcohol. Just then the two of them were passing it back and forth when the, 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 the lecturer wasn't looking and just taking swigs out of this giant Coke bottle filled with booze and I'm like, what? This is and crazy, why come? And then one, I remember another time I went out for lunch and got fairly drunk. I think I just had a few beers with a mate of mine and then was like, oh, are we gonna go to economics? And it's like, yeah, because they take attendance. So you gotta go. Well, it was something, there was some reason we had to go. And uh, yeah, oh my God, there was three hours of just like, oh, just gradually sobering up from lunch. Oh! Bad times. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna interrupt things right there to tell you about today's mm, most glorious of sponsors. Surfshark VPN, yes. Look, there's a couple of reasons that you need a VPN. A couple of reasons why you need Surfshark VPN specifically. Surfshark specifically, because it is ridiculously easy to use. This isn't even in the talking points. All of the various VPNs that you here talked about, Surfshark, I have found to be, you have it, I have it on my iPad, I have it on my Mac, I have it on my phone. It also works on like non-Apple things. We haven't, haven't tried it on any of those because I'm a bit of a Mac boy, but you just open up the app, you click that button, and boom, it just works. There's no weird going into settings that some of these other apps make you do and all of this stuff. With Surfshark, it was just ridiculously easy. Uh, look, things I gotta talk about. Uh, number one, security. If you are somewhere like Starbucks and you're logging onto that free Wi-Fi that says Starbucks, there's no password, there's no nothing, you're just logging on there and you're just hoping for the best. Things are safer than they used to be in terms of, of VPNs. Like, it's less easy for people to steal your stuff even without 
a VPN these days. But there are these things called honeypots, which is basically when the person who lives above Starbucks creates a Wi-Fi network called Starbucks, and then you log on to their network thinking it is Starbucks, and they're managing to like get your data and stuff. But look, you Surfshark VPN, you'll be safe. They also have something called Hacklock, which ser- searches the internet for your passwords. I always say that sounds like something that some bad dudes up to, like the people looking for your passwords. That doesn't sound good. But Surfshark let you know if your information's been stolen, so you're nice and safe. But look, all of this security stuff is all well and good, but the best thing about Surfshark is, of course, for me, at least, the streaming options. Like, I live in Europe. I know that American Netflix is better and bigger and has oh so much more stuff. You can just fire it up. I always go over to Miami and I'm like, hey, look, I've got all of this extra stuff. And also, Americans, hop on over to Europe because you're fine because of license agreements and all that sort of stuff. That you find there'll be stuff, like I've talk- talked about this before, none of the Mission Impossible movies were on American Netflix, but they were all on uh, my local Netflix. Europe, Czech Republic, Netflix. And I was like, okay, <laughs> whatever, I'll take it. It's also unlimited, so you can download as much as you want with no worries, which is, uh, of course, brilliant. And there are no logs, because why would there be? It's a VPN. The reason you're buying it is, well, yeah, no, I guess privacy as well through a VPN. Of course, security, streaming, it's all there. Look, all you want, and there's a 30 day money back guarantee, because of course there is. All you need to do is go to surfshark.deals forward slash blaze, and you'll get 83% off and three extra months for free. Surfshark.deals forward slash blaze, 83% off, three months for free. Because why not? And now back to today's video. It was fairly likely that the mourners of the deceased would pop into the very same tab and they would feel like the mutes were making a mockery of the day's solemn events. After displaying quiet devastation for several hours, the mutes were now rolling around on the floor in drunken laughter and singing jolly songs about the Randy Fisherman's daughter. Danny, what sort of pubs are you going to? <laughs> Today, if you have the skill of holding a silently miserable demeanor for a whole shift without ever flinching, you can always apply to be a UK bus driver. Yes. Bombs away! You might feel like you're do- You might feel like you're going nowhere fast if you've found yourself stuck in a dead-end job with zero potential for career progression. You know, I've had miserable jobs. I've never been in a job where it's like, I've never seen an out, where it's like, you know, like you watch The Office and you're like, Jim, why are you still here? I was like, you know, I'm like four seasons into the American office. I've never seen it before somehow. I've seen the British one, but I never watched the American one. I was like, okay, let's go. And it's like, I've never been in a job like that where you're like, oh my God, I've become trapped and my life isn't going to go anywhere. And you're going to wake up and you're going to be 50 someday. Because that would be really intense. And I feel like that is Jim in the office. And I get, I'm, I get so invested in these office characters. It's it's ridiculous. Like, my passion for Jim and Pam getting together. This is so boring for anyone who has no interest in The Office or people who've seen The Office and they're like, Simon, we're aware of this. But this is all new to me, even though they're all using flip phones. Um, and I'm like, I was so invested in it. My wife's like, dude, they, obviously they're going to get together. Yeah, but you don't know, do you? <laughs> and then they eventually do. And I'm like, yes. Sorry, let's carry on. But one of the ultimate examples of a fucking son. Ah! Can you? You can even see the boom mic is now reflected on. Is now a shadow on my face like a penis. Okay, here we go. Let's move a little bit more. And I got another video to film after this. I don't know what I'm gonna do. To be honest, I guess I'm gonna have to block that window off somehow. But one of the ultimate examples of a dead-end job was that of Patardier's assistant. It sounds French. I'm pronouncing it the French way. Uh, during the late medieval and renaissance periods of France and that's dro- and that's because the job came bundled with so many risks that you weren't likely to survive long enough to think about a promotion. The good news is that your military services were only required during the sieges of ca- castles or fortified cities, so you probably got a fair bit of annual leave. The petard itself was usually a massive bell-shaped brass bomb, excuse me, packed- well, I, I burped, it was kind of silent, but I felt the need to excuse myself. Apologies. With gunpowder and nails and other nasty sharp shit created by the petard maker, or the petardier. But it was down to the petardier's assistants to carry these devices across the battlefield and prop them up against castle walls or gates or inside tunnels where they would be detonated. And I see the problem with this. This wasn't like back in the day where it's like, yeah, yeah, we got grenades strapped to near where our penis is. We've got like rocket launchers strapped to our back because that ain't going to explode. I mean, unless someone shoots it. <laughs> 
But even then, maybe not These with these modern day ones. But back in the day, you could just be like wandering along and it's like, oh no, I rubbed the dynamite the wrong way. I had a sneeze and it blew up. I mean, obviously you wouldn't be saying this because you'll be completely like eviscerated into viscera. Oh my God, I just realized what eviscerate comes from the word viscera. Does it? That would make sense, right? To eviscerate something would be to turn it into viscera. Wow, that belongs on my channel into the shadows. Uh, but what I was saying is like, they're gonna, they, they could easily get blown up. Brilliant. The bell-shaped design ensured that the blast would be forced in a frontward direction at a single point. So the petard could potentially cause some serious damage to the enemy's defenses. The downside is the job was often equally lethal to the assistant. The first problem is that you would be one of the biggest targets on the battlefield. When the enemy caught sight of you mooching around with a big old bomb, they would naturally draw this would naturally draw considerable attention. And even though you'd be kitted out in heavy plate armor, this would often not be enough to save you from heavily fought focused barrage from musketeers and crossbows. The biggest hazard is that the primitive petard was so unreliable that it might go off at any minute, even before you had made it to the castle walls. And even if you did get that far and managed to light the fuse, you might not be able to get away quick enough to escape the explosion you just created. This is the worst job I've... What? <laughs> Being in the military in the past was fun. Being in the military now is like, that's super intense anyway. But I feel like you've got like good armor. There's some drones doing the work for you. Of course, it's extremely dangerous and you have to have like balls of steel. But in the past, it'd be like, <laughs> why have I got cloth armor? Why have I not upgraded? How can you even call armor that's made out of cloth armor, mother <laughs> Jesus. Uh, it's thick. Yeah, bitch, so is my coat, but it's not going to prevent me getting shot. This was the inspiration for the phrase hoist by his own petard, meaning to fall into one's own one owns trap, first used by Shakespeare in Hamlet. Incidentally, the word petard is itself a naughty nickname given to the device by soldiers derived from the French word petier, which meant, essentially means to fart. The idea that the bomb farts out its deadly expulsion of gunpowder and nails. Why, well, yeah, I mean, shit, it'd be like someone farting next to me is not bad, but someone setting off a literal explosion next to my body. In fact, in something I'm probably holding is worse. Subjectively worse. Was that a fart? I don't know. I can taste it. Those wacky French soldiers were always up for a giggle. And one more thing, the fart bomb was so unreliable that it might not go off at all. So that meant you'd just have to go all the way back and recover it for inspection, during which time you'd again be the target for enemy forces observing you carrying a big, big bomb in the other direction. With a fucking lit fuse. Or a fuse that didn't make it go off. You touch it, it's like, oh, I rubbed it the wrong way. <laughs> if that was me, I'd be like, no f way am I going back and collecting that fucking thing? Are you smoking the crack? It didn't work. That's on you, Petier Maker. You prick. This is the one to the Petier's assistant of the month. Never really took off. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. By the beginning of the 18th century, petards have been replaced by slightly more reliable artillery. And so this dead end job was finally killed off once and for all. Do Victorians dream of electric sheep? And so we come to a strong contender for the worst job in history. I had no idea that so much work was involved in between shearing sheep and producing wool suitable for clothing. You can't just knit a woolly jumper immediately after shearing. Oh my god, I had no idea about this. I just realized, oh yeah, of course, wool comes from sheep. <laughs> Like, and then it gets made into a coat. I was just like, yeah, just, you know, you're just da 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 da. Done. F easy. Untreated wool is nasty, oily, greasy, scratchy stuff, which you wouldn't want next to your skin at all. I have a, <laughs> I remember I went to like, it was like a market, like a farmer's market, and they had a bunch of these sheepskins. And I was like, oh, those are really nice. <laughs> I'll just buy like 10, I bought like a whole bunch of them. It wasn't 10, it was like seven or eight or something. So I just got a new house and I was like, let's put these around the place. Let's decorate the lounge. It'll be nice to have the little seating areas. And it was beautiful. It looks lovely on the like sofa and stuff. Nice decoration, also super comfortable. But it also made my living room smell of farm for about six months. And I was like spraying that down with Febreze. And then uh, eventually it went away and now it just looks nice. 
So at least there's that. What a pointless story. <laughs> what you really needed was a wool fuller who'd come along and clean the cloth to eradicate all the impurities and make the material softer and thicker. The best way of doing this was to put the untreated wool in a vat of liquid and get a team of wool fullers to spend all day trampling over it with their bare feet. That doesn't sound a bit bad. That doesn't sound too bad. This might sound a bit dull, but wait until you hear about the exact nature of the liquid. Yes, of course, it had to be stale human urine. Of course it did. I'm gonna guess it's got something to do with the ammonia in it? Is that, or urea? Is it ammonia and urea? Those two seem to be the magic ingredients in piss. I don't know why there are magic ingredients in piss, but the Romans used urea for washing shit, didn't they? Ammonia is like, also, ah, look, fuck it, let's just move on. I am disgusted. Apparently, this was perfect for getting rid of the dirt and grease in no time at all. The job of continually trampling wool into human beers has been around since ancient Roman times, and although the use of human urine was frowned upon in some quarters by the time we got to the Victorian era, it was still very much in wide use. But this got me thinking. I'm not trying to take the piss when I ask this, but where exactly did they extract the urine from? Well, some of the more fortunate wool fillers were able to take time out from the piss vats to go round collecting gallons of the stuff from public toilets and private homes. Those lucky buggers! Where are you going? I'm going to the public toilets in the park to collect all the piss from the urinals. I can think of nothing worse. Even when, it's, even when a public toilet smells too much of piss, you're like, oh, oh, I'm just going to pee outside and risk getting put on the sex offenders register. You're so disgusting. That's not white chocolate. That's your dick. I know. Well, you oh. don't. And this got me thinking about the people who did that kind of thing full time, because when I was talking about the worst job in history, I wasn't talking about the Woolfellers. They ended easy. Every minute of every shift was a special water cooler moment. But consider the night soil men or gong farmers who, whose full time position was to collect your waste under the veil of shadow. Ah, oh, this f look, look, there it's back. Can you see it? What? Ah, oh, ah. Oh. How much longer? I want to be done so I can block the thing, but I also don't want to stop the video. And then I have two video files. My life is so difficult. You're just gonna have to put up with a penis on my face. Huge whopping penis, wow. Before the days of such luxuries as flushing toilets, most Victorians had to do their business in a privy or unlined cesspool, which was basically just a big shelf with a hole hidden inside a wooden hut for privacy. And as there was no outlet, these would need to be emptied around twice per year, although that sounds like a bare minimum to me. The night soil men would work between the hours of 9pm and 5am and dig out all the waste with a shovel before using a complicated system of buckets and carts to haul it away to a bigger cesspit or an official dump outside the city. Some of the more entrepreneurial night soil men would sell the waste to farmers as fertilizer for their crops. The circle, the circle of life. Oh shit, literally. The hours were pretty antisocial, but that was the least of the gong farmers' problems as they were often waist deep in human excrement. The poor souls were only permitted to live in specific areas and they could find themselves overcome or even asphyxiated by the noxious fumes. But there were... Oh, now I have to end it anyway because I got a phone call from a delivery man. A few moments later. Never mind, wasn't the delivery man. <laughs> Story from my personal life. I bought my wife a really nice pen <laughs> for Christmas. And about four days later, she doesn't put the... It's not her fault. I know it's not her fault. <laughs> but she doesn't put the cap on the end of the pen. And it just rolls off the table. And it lands nib down. It's a fountain pen. And they just call me and they're like, yeah. Turns out we can't replace it. You're going to have to get a new nib. And I'm like, how much is that? And they're like, it's the equivalent of about 200 pounds. It's like, oh, Brilliant! Brilliant! Great. And the sun's in my eyes! But there were a few perks to the job. What the f are you talking about? Oh, gong farmers, they harvest the human shit. Great. But there were a few perks to the job. They were paid pretty well for starters, earning in one night what most folks earn in a week. Not only that, but they'd often find coins and lost jewelry within the waste if they searched hard enough, and this was an extra bonus to top up their pay packets. They probably had no friends with which to share this lavatorial wealth, so they could live in the relative lap of luxury in their own designated stink zones. The night saw men were possibly even cursing the invention of the fancy flushing toilet in 1596, although it didn't become widely used until modern sewage systems became widespread in the mid-19th century. So they've got 300 years <laughs> extra. You imagine like the self-driving truck comes along and the people are like, we're f***ed in 300 years. It's like, no, 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 that's sooner than you think, guys. Maybe you don't train for that right now. A lot of people claim that their job is okay, but the money is sh 
that. The Gong farmers could at least say that while their job was shit, the money they made made them feel pretty damn flush. Oh, was that like two puns in a single sentence, Dano? And that's a brilliant place to end today's video, also because it's the end of the script. Thank you for watching. Couldn't I? Couldn't you have rung like two minutes later and then I would have done it all in one? God damn it! Sam, can you do some sparkly effects on me? Make me look like Edward. Sam, make me beautiful.